I was some, one of those people you see in the downtown east side. And the the one thing I wanted to spell, Lisa read a, you know, you read a very nice bio introduction and it sounds like I'm all that in a bag of chips and you look at the awards on the wall and think that I'm self-accomplished, but uh, nothing could be further from the truth. I'm actually here today because of over 10,000 people. I'm here today because of healthcare professionals and teachers and other people with lived experience who helped me and, and nurtured me along the way. I'm here today because people invested in my possibility. In, in the late 1980s, I was someone who pushed a shopping cart. I was an opi I was opioid dependent. Um, I collected cans and bottles. I lived under the Georgia Viaduct and I was a regular face in the downtown east side. I was in those clinics. I was in and out of detoxes and jails and, and uh, in and out of the Harbor Light and UGM, in and out of the hospital emergency rooms at St. Paul's. I was a high volume contact user of emergency services. Um, high vol 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 volume contact with, with uh, first responders, with ambulance, fire, police. For, for years, uh, you know, I couldn't find the way out on my own. I knew that there was potential, but I couldn't find it. And that's one of the reasons why I believe so much in, in possibility. So what is possibility? Well, let's talk about what it isn't. And, and I think that uh, there's, there's a lens that I want us to look through. If you look at the last four years, even before that, we have been dealt with a lot of crisis, you know, COVID, but more than that, we're, we're now we're dealing with a world that has two wars. There's interest rates, working professionals can't afford a home in this province, um, gas prices, high level of divisiveness and incivility, worker shortages. I could go on and on. All of these things impact the way we see the world, the way we see our potential, the way we see others' potential. And what happens, and Daniel Kahneman wrote about this in his book, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow, is that we revert down into a survival brain. And so we look for cues on where we're going to be successful and where we're not, and that determines where we're going to put our energy. So that's probability. Now, here's a great example. If you've never been successful or you know, tried and failed at a health or, or, or fitness goal, and I picked that because it's, it's a favorite one for many, then the likelihood of you being successful the next time is low. So your brain says, why bother putting energy into that? So that's a probability mindset. We assess our, our past experience and the likelihood of us being successful. And the thing is, most times we're accurate. So this is where it becomes a conundrum because possibility is the other side. Possibility is looking at ourselves, the world, the people we support, our family, our community, our country, our globe, and say what could be. Imagination. See, this is the cornerstone of every great uh, entrepreneur story. It's the story of, of, uh, of the thing that we admire in all great coaches and leaders and parents. Every single one of us is here today because somebody invested in our possibility, right? Possibility is the thing that we admire in great change makers like Dr. Martin Luther King or Nelson Mandela or a one-legged boy from Coquitlam who had the audacity to try and run across the can Canada to raise money for cancer. And of course, I'm referencing Terry Fox. Was it probable? Likely? No. Was it possible? When we look through the lens of possibility, we're able to see potential, even though sometimes that potential is very difficult to see. My potential is in that picture, but it's hard to see. And I think that if we're going to get to a place where we collapse stigma, we ha have to ask more empathic questions like, what happened before this? You know, I'm about to spend four days in the downtown poor, um, going to some learning and I'm going to be right in Gastown. And, and one of the things that comes to mind when I meet somebody is, you know, what's their story? Because when we do that, we begin to, to ask, well, those being empathically curious, but also getting to the place where maybe we can stem the flow of some of the folks that are falling uh, through the cracks. My story starts really good. You know, I grew up in Midland, Ontario. This is me in grade two. You know, I wasn't a particularly good student. I, I didn't find out until my 40s I had dyslexia and ADHD. <laughs> so, I, you know, I was a class clown. That's how I got my attention. I was just, my my brain was like scattered all the time. And uh, what I loved more than school was home. Waiting for me at home was this extraordinary family. You know, I had a dad who was larger than life. Uh, my mom was a stay-at-home mom. She could have had a career, but she was following in the footsteps of her mom. I had an older brother, younger sister. And for the first eight years, you know, my life was perfect. You know, my dad was this larger than life guy who was a baseball coach, hockey coach. He just loved being a dad. You know, we were a lower middle class family. We didn't have a lot of money. But what we had was family wealth, if that makes any sense. We had a connectedness. Um, but all of that was shattered one morning in 1975 when we woke up and dad had passed away suddenly from a heart, heart attack. 
And three things happened in that moment. You know, my mom, she lost her partner in this relationship to raise these three small kids, age five, eight, and 11. I lost my hero, my dad. A guy would say things to me like, I love you, you can do and be anything. And our family lost our economic security. And so just like that, you know, our family started to slide sideways. And I remember this was probably the very first signs of, of mental health challenges in my life because I started to feel awkward and weird. What happened next was a series of very unfortunate events. My mom remarried quickly. And the guy who came into the family next, unfortunately, he wasn't like my dad. He was a, a violent, abusive alcoholic. And so I went from a father that would say things like, I love you, you can do and be anything to a man who'd say things like, you're stupid, dumb, and you'll never amount to anything. And I was nine years old. And I didn't know how to process that. And, you know, when we when I look at some of Dr. Gabor Mate's work, he talks about that impact of early childhood trauma. For me, I had the grief of losing dad and the ongoing physical, mental, and emotional abuse from my stepfather. Right? Now, some of this story you might look at and go, I, I don't really relate to that. But if you think about the last couple of years, the adversity challenge and change that we've all dealt with, it's almost like we're living in a world where the ground is shifting underneath us. There's a lot of uncertainty. Uh, sometimes we don't have access to the resources we need. We go to bed with a head full of problems, wake up the next morning and have to solve those problems or somehow move, move our life forward. That was my life for a lot of years. And when COVID hit, I understood the emotional impact it was having on people because of my early childhood experience and then the experience I had um, being unhoused and, and, and going through, through that. But at nine years old, I was confused. I was a target for bullying. I was awkward at school. And when my brother and his older friends invited me to use drugs, I joined. And I didn't join because I thought it would be cool, fun, or exciting. I joined because I wanted to belong. You know, I've shared my story now with over a million young people all around Canada, the United States, and throughout the world. And I talk about that self-pressure. Kids today, uh, young people today, have so much self-pressure. Social media exacerbates that. But that, that need to sort of live up to an unreasonable standard. And I use drugs, and a couple things happened. I, I went home, and my father, my stepfather, he didn't scare me anymore. You know, I remember he came in the house, he was loud and aggressive. And first time out in my life, I wasn't afraid. I found a place to cope in an uncertain world. And that began a, a pattern, you know, for the next 15 years of my life. When I've watched over the last few years and when crisis hits organizations or crisis hits community or COVID or, you know, these different things impact um, different folks, it's really normal and natural for us to seek something to offset that, to alter our emotional state. And that's why we saw an uptick in, you know, social media use, streaming media, eating, drinking more, smoking more, um, disengaging, isolating, high, higher levels of anxiety and panic attacks. Because when human beings are in an uncertain environment, we want to try and do something to control that. Right? So I found a way to cope. The, the problem was it, it would create devastating consequences. By the time I was 15, I was getting in trouble at, at home and I got kicked out of the house. At 16, I got kicked out of school. And at 17, I got arrested for the first time. And my life was like sliding fast out of control. And there was only one good thing that was going on in my life at that time. And it, it, was, a, it was a girl I was dating um, who really encouraged me and and uh, we we had we had started dating at uh, the beginning of grade ten, but I, by this time I wasn't going to classes anymore, and my life was, you know, the consequences of my behavior were were increasing. And so what happened is that, and this by the way, this relationship meant a great deal to me because it was sort of my only tether to any kind of thing normal in life because my home life was chaos. And anyway, she sat me down and she said, I want to go to college. I want to have a family. I want to have a career. I don't want to go where you're going. I believe in you, but you know, this is where, you know, this, this relationship ends. And I remember feeling devastated. And so, you know, I, I went 
and leaned on the thing that had helped me cope before, which was more, you know, more substance. And um, I decided I was going to leave that small community and Expo 86 was going on in Vancouver. And so I got on a Greyhound bus and I came, I came out to Vancouver. And back in those days, the bus station was down on um, across the street from the Sandman on Georgia. And I remember I got off the bus with my little Adidas um, gym bag. And I went down and there's a little park. It's, part of it is still there. Part of it got gobbled up with the new condos, but the, part of the park is still there. And, and I remember looking out over the park onto Expo. Um, there's an arena there now where they play hockey, but that was a big parking lot. And I remember the sun was coming up over the downtown east side. And I thought, yes, this is the place where I'm going to get a do over and my life's going to blossom. But what had happened, I was, a, I was a kid who moved away from a small community into, into Vancouver and Vancouver had a lot, a lot of danger waiting for me. And I had no oversight. I had, you know, my mom was 3000 kilometers away. You know, I, I moved away from the school I could have integrated with. And so the predictable happened and that park that I had the celebration in would end up being my home. And I remember for, for a number of years, as I walked up and down Granville street and hung out in front of the lot, in front of the, you know, the art gallery until those days, I finally graduated and moved into the downtown East side. I, I kept wondering, like, there's gotta be more to life than this, but I couldn't access it. I couldn't get there on my own. And that's why I, I give credit where it's due. I'm he I'm here today because of over 10,000 people, you know, who, who helped me when I was really vulnerable. Um, three days before Christmas, 1989, I was in the downtown East side and, you know, I was struggling. And by this time I was opioid dependent and I was in this sort of vicious cycle of, uh addiction and substance use disorder um and and i couldn't break that cycle on my own and and what it looked like was every morning i would wake up and i begin to descend into withdrawal and again i i don't say this to trigger anyone but for those who are unfamiliar with opiate withdrawal it's like the worst flu you've ever had so think about a time when you've been really sick you know when you get the flu and you get like achy um, you get a pounding headache, you're not hungry, hot sweats, cold sweats, really low energy. So imagine, you know, that time when you've been really sick. Now imagine you're sick, except you're on a park bench in Pigeon Park in a pouring rain in December. And that's that was me. I was wearing a red lumber jacket and I remember rocking back and forth thinking, where am I going to get 10 bucks? Where am I going to get 10 bucks? And I didn't want to rob or steal it's not who I was, but I needed ten dollars in the worst way, and I came up with what I thought was a good idea. And I, I walked into the to the hotel, Kitty Corner, to Pigeon Park. It's called. Uh, it was called. Uh, oh, Rainbow. the Rainbow. Yeah, thank you. There's a voice down there. I don't know if you heard that. <laughs> it's called the Rainbow Hotel, and now it's called the Pennsylvania. But. I believe it's it's also part of uh, BC Housing. But anyways, I walked in there. It was a pub. And, and I walked out 10 minutes later, having sold the only item I had left in the world that was worth any money. And it was the boots off my feet. And I remember walking up the street um, broken and hopeless. And I remember, I'll never forget the feeling, that cold concrete on my sock on that wet December day. And it was three days before Christmas. And I remember this because it was my brother's birthday. And I was grateful it was raining because I was so ashamed and, you know, and I was, I was weeping. And I, I was in this moment where like, I just couldn't figure out how I was going to get to another sunset. I was so hopeless. You know, over the past couple of years, we've seen a lot of people navigate a lot of emotional stuff. You know, we lost a lot of people with COVID and it's just, it's just a, a really tough time right now for many folks. We've high rates of burnout and stress, high rates of, of folks reporting stuff. And I, I don't have an answer 
to everything, but I know what dark days look like. And I'll say this, the heaviest thing that I ever lifted in my life was my hand for help. And I always lived in the illusion of self-sufficiency. The other thing is I carried around a lot of my stuff without people knowing. I didn't let them in to help me. You know, there might, might even be one or two people on the call right now that have been carrying a real heavy weight for a real long time. And even the people who love you the most don't know how it's impacted you. You know, in this moment, something changed for me and I became willing to accept help. And what I did next is, was something that was very uncharacteristic. I reached out, out and I said a little prayer. And I'm not somebody who is deeply religious, um, but I always believed in something. And the prayer went something like, God, give me a second chance. I don't deserve it, but I'd love a second chance. And if you give it to me, I, I'll do something to, to pay it forward and uh, to help someone else. The next day, I walked into a Salvation Army. It's called the Crosswalk. Uh, it used to be on um, across from Woodward's. It's, it's moved now. And uh, I met a fellow there, and he helped connect me with my mom. And uh, you got to love moms. And I, I begged her for one more chance, and she said, okay, I'll give you one more. And she flew out to Vancouver. I was 165 pounds. She scooped me up. She took me back to Ontario. In many ways, mom provided a housing first strategy for me. Right. But she knew that she didn't have the, the assets and capability to, to, to delve into some of the deeper trauma and the, the core issues as to why that substance use disorder would persist. So she fought like crazy to get me into a detox and a full, full residential treatment program. And, um, uh, that was 32 years ago. Things have been going pretty good. Now, I often think uh, how many kids out there have the same potential, but they don't have my mom, you know? Before I left the downtown east side, I had probably one of the most important leadership discussions with a guy on a park bench that I spent 10 minutes with, and his name was Gus. And what I'll tell you what happened that day. He was waiting for the number 10 or number 8 Fraser bus right in front of Army and Navy. In fact, I think that bus shelter is still there. And I was sitting there. And the only reason I approached this guy is I was a panhandler. Um, you know, I, I was kind of a selfish guy back then. And, and I saw him as an easy target. And I sat down beside him and I asked him for a couple of dollars. And he was really kind to me. He looked past my uh, selfish behavior and he, he gave me, but he gave me something more than money. I remember he looked at me with these eyes that were filled with empathy and compassion. And, and he said to me, he says, you know, Joe, you're a remarkable young man. He says, if you were able to deal with some of your, you know, obvious challenges, you could go out into the world and you could do something remarkable. He said, Joe, there's more to you than you can see. At the time, I was a dirty, disheveled, rough around the edges, street involved kid, had black fingernails scruffy beard, broken yellow teeth, matted hair that hadn't been combed and clothes I've been wearing for over a year. You know, and the poor personal hygiene that comes with that. And, and for the first time in my life, someone other than my mom or my daddy spoke to my possibility. You know, just because possibility isn't easy to see doesn't mean it's not there. You know, possibility is is always present. You know, it's starting tomorrow, our future is spotless. But we look through the lens and live through the lens of probability. But when it comes to raising kids or investment in people, I think we ought to look through the lens of possibility. Because possibility is it's where the magic is. You know, but it's hard for us to do that because when we're tired and we don't see the results and we get worn, it's difficult. And then we get distethered from our purpose and our passion. And it becomes harder for us to see that possibility in the world that we live in. But I guarantee you it's there. You know, evidence of possibility is everywhere. You know, 200 years ago, we didn't have electricity in our house. And today we have cell phones and cars and planes we can fly around. We get 
satellites and Mars. You, you know, 200 years ago, you could you couldn't flick a light on in your house, and now you can call up Richard Branson and jump on a spaceship and and do commercial uh, aer aerospace travel. Right now, all of the things that we enjoy in our modern world once only existed in the realm of imagination and possibility until somebody pulled it out of there. And I believe that all of the woes that our society and world have, there are solutions to them in that ether of possibility. Now, Gus was fundamentally right about me, but I didn't begin to discover that until years later. You know, back in Ontario, I had a social worker. You know, I'd, I'd completed six months of treatment and the social worker tricked me into going back to college. I say he tricked me. He just flat out lied to me. I'll tell you the truth. His name was Brian. And he said to me, if you don't go get a job or go to school, we're going to kick you out of this facility. And I had six months of recovery uh, under my belt. And I didn't want to, I didn't want to mess up. I certainly didn't want to go backwards. So begrudgingly, I signed up to go to college. And I didn't think it would work for me because I walked around with a story that I was stupid, right? You know, if you can get a kid to believe a lie, you can, why, why, why would somebody who's already made their mind up that they're not smart, take any action forward? See, Carol Dweck, a uh, famous uh, Stanford professor who wrote the book on growth versus fixed mindset, studied kids. And what she determined is the kids that show the most resilience are those who understand that their actions beget their talents. They're not, our talents aren't fixed. Talent and capacity can grow with action. But if you got a story, then you're walking into that already defeated. Anyways, I um, I went on to, to the campus at Loyola. So I had these great teachers, professors, educators who worked with me. I started to get A's. I started to get B's. All of a sudden, I started to bloom and flower. And after three and a half years on a beautiful, bright, sunny afternoon, like we're going to have this weekend, I walked across that stage at Loyola. They called out my name. They said, Joe Roberts, Dean's List. You know, I graduated with a 3.94 GPA. Turns out I wasn't, I wasn't stupid, but I'd never applied myself. And I remember walking down to where mom was sitting and she gave me a kiss on the cheek and a big bear hug. And she said, I'm proud of you, son. Um, in that moment, I have to tell you, it was almost like that saving private Ryan moment at the end of the movie. If you've ever seen that, I, I began questioning why me? I'm not special. I'm not. I'm not particularly gifted, talented, or intelligent. I, I'm persistent. I put one foot in front of the other, and I'm fortunate enough that I met people like Brian, who tricked me into going to school, people like Gus, who pointed to my possibility and potential, and a mom that wouldn't quit. You know, sometimes a person, all they need is one person to say, I believe in you. And, uh, and that drives a lot of the work I do today. After graduating, I decided to come back to Vancouver. My brother lived in Richmond. I camped on his couch for a few weeks. I got a job at Minolta that lasted a year. <clears throat> a friend of mine was starting a company in North Vancouver. He asked me to join and be vice president of business development, which was kind of a joke. It was just two of us in a basement and I'm the vice president. And he was the CEO. But uh, anyways, we started and we put our heads down and we worked really, really hard. And after five years, we came up for a breath and, we had built an incredibly successful media development company. Now, I remember I came into the office in Yale Town one day, and we had a whole pile of people working for us. And you know, we had we had built this this incredibly gifted, talented um, digital content development company. And uh, sitting on my desk uh, when I came into that office that day was a copy of Canadian Business, and I was on the cover of it. You know, my office was about three blocks from the Georgia Viaduct. And I remember having a moment because I'd realized how far I'd come. In less than 12 years, I went from the kid pushing the shopping cart to being the, I'm the you know, the Canadian version of the American dream. Now, when I, when I tell this story to businesses and bankers and sales folks, they like that part, the... Uh, you know, the manifest destiny and you can do it and isn't that great. But I'll tell you the truth because I think you'll get this. I got all those things that they promise in our Western culture and I wasn't any more satisfied. I got the accolades. I made a little bit of money out of house. Right? But I wasn't, there was something inside of me that was still a little empty. 
And so in 2003, my daughter was born and I sold my, my part of the company that gave me the, the ability to coast. I didn't have to go to work anymore for, for a while. And I began to question what I wanted to do next. And, and I really started to question purpose and legacy and impact. And a few years had passed. I got to spend some time with my daughter in her early years. And I got restless and I started to work and I started to speak. I started going to high schools and boards of trade. And then I wrote a book and I started to speak more and do advocacy. And, and then I started working with this guy named Dr. Sean Richardson who's from the North Shore. His dad's a prominent lawyer. And Sean had experience as a Canadian Olympian and then uh, did his doctoral thesis in uh, in elite sport and high performance. And so he and I were working as consulting managers and going or flying around the country and speaking at various conferences. And one day on a flight into Calgary, I told Sean, I said, you know, Sean, I told him the boot story that, you know, on my, on my darkest day, I made a promise to pay it forward. And I, I felt like this was the time for me to, to do something, to pay it forward. And, and I said, what could we do? And, you know, we were just kind of knocking around ideas. He said, well, what's important to you? I said, I'd love to raise the volume on what we could do to better protect vulnerable kids. Get them before they hit the streets. Get them before they drop out of college. Support them with the mental health supports or the, you know, the treatment or the therapy or the housing or whatever it is that they need. Reach out. And we know who these young people are. They're very easily identifiable, especially in a school system. And get them the support they need. So we were boring off of this, you know, research that was done in Geelong, Australia. And we we really liked the project because it was early detection. But then we said, okay, well, what does this, what does this look like? You know, and we we're spitballing this on the airplane. And then Sean said to me something curious. He says, Hey, Joe, when Canadians want to raise awareness and inspire the country to think differently about something, they run across the country. He says, Why don't you run across Canada, Joe? And I remember looking at him and I said, well, why don't you run across Canada? <laughs> the last thing I was thinking of doing is running across the country. I was, I'll tell you who I was at 45 years old. I was a non-athlete. In fact, most of my life I was a non-athlete. I, I failed grade nine and grade 10 gym. You know, and at 45, I was this out of shape business guy had sat behind a desk for 10 years. And so the notion of running across Canada, I dismissed immediately through a probability lens, right? Then he said something curious. John said, you love telling your story. And when you do, people are inspired. He says, what if you what if you didn't run? What if you walked across the country and told your story? You know, and along the way, you could you could push for change. And there was something about that that made my hair on my neck kind of go up. I thought, yeah, that could work. But then I said, well, how would it be different? He says, I got it. He says, why don't you push a shopping cart? It's a symbol of chronic homelessness. It's a thing you're trying to avoid for every kid. He says, um, as far as I know, nobody's ever pushed a shopping cart across Canada. That'd be different. And it's the throw to your story. And uh, yeah, so we started noodling this idea. And <clears throat> first problem we had was, the, you know, the shopping cart. Uh, I wasn't going to push a real shopping cart. I don't know about you. Every time I go to the grocery store, I get the shopping cart with the wheel. <laughs> it doesn't work. I wouldn't get past Chilliwack was one of those. So we knew we needed something lightweight. We got kids from Pine Tree Secondary School. We got them together, did a think tank exercise. They said, use a baby carriage and trick it out into a shopping cart. We thought, oh, what a great idea. So we got one of these, you know, really high performance, active mom or mom and dad baby carriages and got a metal fabricator to put a cage on it to look like a shopping cart. So now we had one of 10,000 problems solved. And over the next several years, we slowly worked through the rest of the problems. And the thing that was important for us is to raise the volume on, on the issue. So we needed a high level of community engagement. So it wasn't just about walking across Canada. It was about engaging across Canada as we went. Without getting into the details, um, there were 27 problems that we ran into that if one of those 27 problems, just one, didn't get resolved, we wouldn't be able to go. Um, but slowly we worked through everything and eventually I found myself in Cape Spear, Newfoundland, um, working in through that, that possibility context. I was now poised 
to take a stab at, at, at walking across Canada. And I was terrified when this picture was taken because I thought my body's not going to make it and no one's going to care. This short video that I'm going to share with you shows how wrong I was on both of those fears. It's inspiring. I hope you like it. This is for you know every kid in this country who feels different, who gets stuck. And it's our responsibility to reach out and help those children transition safely into adulthood. You know sometimes Coming over the bridge, here we are, and there's Joe, push for change. Have courage to find the people around you care. Go wrong or right, just a love that we can share. Ain't no pain, how we've suffered along the way. When the campaign was over, I'd walked 11,375,000 steps, but I didn't lose one pound. <laughs> not one pound. There's no justice in social justice, but <laughs> that's not the point. You know what? Walking 9,000 kilometers across Canada wasn't the greatest part of this. What, what was the coolest part was the kids. We got to engage over 100,000 young people, along with service providers, organized labor, law enforcement, and, and front-facing organizations from from coast to coast. 
Uh, we also went into the remote areas in the north as well. We didn't walk up there, but we we visited. Um, you know, I had spent a lot of, of, of hours and months and years building and then five months to get to the Ontario border. Now, I'll remember this day like it was yesterday. I, I remember cresting the bridge from Quebec into Ontario and there was about a thousand people waiting for me. You know, sometimes when you're building big projects, there's a lot of lonely days. You just don't feel like you're moving the needle and then all of a sudden something big happens. And that was that day. And I remember walking down the bridge deck. There was about a thousand kids and the OPP, the commissioner of the OPP came out to meet me. And uh, waiting at the bottom of that bridge was the greatest hockey dad in the world, Walter Gretzky. And I remember just feeling, you know, so honored to have Walter come out. You know, he's uh, when he was alive, Walter did a lot of things for the good of Canada and the good of hockey and the good of many, many, many charities through the Wayne Gretzky Foundation. And he came out and walked with me. And I remember saying, Walter, what one piece of advice would you give me as I'm about to go into northern Ontario in the winter? And I remember Walter looked at me and he said, don't quit. <laughs> and I remember thinking, okay, I was hoping for Stanley Cup kind of advice, but okay, don't quit. Then he said it. He said, remember the kids. And just that simple narrative, like that simple ma message helped me connect to my, my, my passion and purpose of why I was doing this. Because when I got into Northern Ontario, it got weird. It got, it got weird. And then it got even weirder. I posted this on the social media. My mom phoned me and said, you kids in your dangerous selfies. I said, mom, it's Photoshop. She said, I don't care what kind of bear it is. <laughs> Anyways, uh, we had some fun, but I, I need to tell you, there was there was some really hard days. Sometimes passion is a, a double-edged sword. And I find this a lot with people in the helps world. You know, good at, good at supporting and helping other people. Not so good at taking care of ourselves sometimes. And I had, I had pushed myself really far. And it's funny because one of the things I've done uh, on some of these other calls and, and training is talk about stress management and, and uh, energy health management, because these are pieces that I got, I got real wrong uh, during the while. I wasn't doing self-care. I wasn't sleeping properly, eating, resting properly. Um, and so I, I got discouraged and distethered from that purpose. Right. But one day, um, you know, I was, I was having a, a tough emotional day and I rounded the corner and uh, I saw, I was, I found myself with a Wawa goose and, and something happened for me in that moment. I, I realized I just walked halfway across Canada. I was a 50 year old non-athlete and I just pushed a shopping cart halfway across Lake Superior in the middle of winter. And I knew in that moment that if I can get through that, I can get through anything. And, and I feel that way for a lot of us. The last few years have been hard. You know, and there's no guarantee that it's going to get better. But if we can get through that, we can get through anything. I think if we balance self-care, we connect ourselves to a, our sense of purpose and passion and, and think long game. Um, I, I think that some of the, the challenges can actually help quicken our step as, as we move down the road. In that moment, I knew I was going to make it and I was right. I, I walked out of Ontario, across Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, back into British Columbia, and finally that final day down East Hastings. And I remember the day, like, it, it, I got into the downtown East Side, and there was, again, there was a crowd of about a thousand people. And, and the crowd got quiet as we went through past, you know, the, uh, past that Astoria Hotel, past the Patricia we got to Maine and Hastings, down past the Balmoral and the region. And uh, I just remember having a moment. You know, back in the day when I was on the street, I was really ashamed. And we talk about stigma. I had self-stigma. I hated myself. And I could never look at anybody in the eye. I always look at my feet. And I come up for a second and go back down. On this day, I wasn't ashamed. My chin was up. I walked past that corner where I'd made the prayer and promise. I, I walked past that bench. I'd sold my boots. I walked past that bus stop where Gus told me about my potential. I turned the corner at Camby and we went up, uh, up in front of BC Place Stadium and we had our last event and we successfully wrapped up the campaign. Now, 
I get a lot of attaboys and awards and accolades for the work, but the person who worked harder, or if not harder on this campaign than me is Marie. She was the heart behind the cart. She was our campaign program designer and she managed everything, every event, every donated dollar, uh, all the traditional media and social media. She even spent 17 months on the road with me and Bobby McGee, our driver. If that ain't commitment, I don't know what is. And um, so you probably guessed it, Marie and I, we share our life together as husband and wife. And so it's our collective vision and values that shine the light forward. We want to use the time we have left to spread a message of possibility and an epidemic of self-worth. And so it is that passion that lights the path forward for us. But Marie and I also share something else. We share history. Um, this is my favorite part. <laughs> That's because Marie is the same girl I dated in grade 10. <laughs> and after 28 years, we found each other again. Two months before the campaign shoved off, we made it official and got married. And uh, we just celebrated our, our anniversary. So I, I can't help but see the world through possibility. It's in every step and and every cell in, in my, the fiber of my being, you know, there, there's no guarantee that we're not going to have more storms ahead, but just because it's not getting better doesn't mean we can't. I didn't wait for the bars to close to get sober. All right. There's three things I want you to take away from today. I want focus on the process, work on those small steps. I didn't walk across Canada province at a time. I did it a step at a time. Anytime we're working on something big, master the process, continue to stay in action. Number two, connect to your purpose, your why. If I was to workshop this with you and ask you to write out a paragraph of what your work means to you, your best day or your best story, reflect on that because in there are the values that mean the most to you. But when we deal with change in turbulent times or we get burnt out, we get distethered from that. And we get disconnected from that joy and that bliss and that energy. And the last thing is be like Gus. Catch people doing good. I love doing this with kids and banging on my door selling girl guy cookies. I don't care if it's that or the Kool-Aid stand. Or look for an opportunity to speak to someone's potential. And get someone in your corner to encourage you. I think if, if everybody had a Gus and was like Gus, we'd have a more resilient joy-filled world. I do believe that change is possible. Um, I believe that it's possible for you and it's possible for me. Um, I believe that we live at a time and in the not too distant future, we're going to call this before as each one of us wakes up to our possibility and potential and picks up the mantle that's our opus and marks forward with courageous action. We can change and affect the world around us. We truly can, but not a minute before we change ourselves and our mindset. And the reason I believe that is the first time I had that thought, I was sitting on a piece of cardboard in front of the Thurlow liquor store. Um, I, I may not get a chance if we were in person, I, 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 would, I would get a chance to chat with you afterwards. And so I promised that I would give you direct access and, and connection to me. That QR code, you may, might wanna just take a picture of that with your phone. That'll send you directly to my LinkedIn. Uh, I'm easy to find. Joe Roberts, Skid Row CEO at LinkedIn. That's the website. And if you've got question, comment, or concern, again, that, that email address, and I'll put that also in the Q&A before I'm done here today, please reach out to me. If you've got an event or something that you're planning, you think I can be impactful, I'd love to work with you. I want to leave you with one last little story, and then I'll open it up for questions. When I was in Newfoundland, a reporter in Cornerbrook asked me a question. He said, what does the push for change mean to you? And <clears throat> earlier that week, I was walking through Terra Nova National Park, middle of nowhere. There's literally more moose than there are people. You know, this, and I happened to look down on this cold, windy, rainy day, and I found this penny. You know, it's the scuffed up one there. And, and what was remarkable, look at this picture. Look at the side of the road. See the color of that dirt? The dirt was the exact same color as the penny. And I happened to look down at the split second and saw this penny. And I picked it up. I scraped it. 
I knocked it on the side of my my shopping cart and I knew that it meant something. And I continued walking that day. And finally, this metaphor came searing home to me. You see, I found this penny in the street. You know, this penny, this penny had traveled a tougher road. This penny had seen things. This penny, this penny had spent a couple of nights out in the weather. What occurred to me, though, as I held that penny in my hand, is even though this pe penny didn't look as pretty and shiny as the other pennies or pretty and shiny as the day it was minted, by the very nature of what it is, it can never, ever, ever lose its value. And the reporter said, yeah, but pennies have been taken out of circulation. I said, yeah, I know. And if enough of us cared, we could take youth homelessness out of circulation. And... uh Anyways, I put that penny in my pocket and I gave it, I, I knew I wanted to give it to somebody who understood my sentiment. When I got to Vancouver, I gave it to the president of the United Association of Canada and he traded me with a check for a million dollars. And that continues to fund the work that we do in schools uh, to support youth empowerment projects that impact youth at risk. Friends, in 1989, I climbed out of the downtown east side just desperately searching uh, for the better part of me. And I found it. I found it thanks to healthcare professionals, social workers, other people who lived experience. And, and I am a living, breathing Humpty Dumpty who got put back together again. And I'll forever be grateful. I don't want you to underestimate the work you do and the impact you have on others. Whether you're an administrator or somebody who's front facing, we don't know the impact. Gus doesn't know the impact he had on me. And he spent 10 minutes with me. You know, everything that I have in my life today that's good and pure is because people invested in my possibility and gave me a second chance. So I want to thank you and honor you for the work you do on behalf of me and my family. I want to wish you a happy Easter. If you don't acknowledge or celebrate Easter, uh, a very happy weekend. Um, may it be, you know, peaceful and you get a chance to put your feet up and spend time with family. At this point, I'm going to now... Uh, open it up and, and ask some questions. The other thing I'm going to do for you, just because I'm feeling it, is the book over my corner uh, shoulder. I want everybody to have it. Not a physical copy, but I, I'm going to send Lisa and the organizers an electronic version where you can go and actually access it with a code. Uh, we're not harvesting emails. We don't want your email. That's it's not that's not why we're doing it. But I'd love for you to have a free copy of, of the book. So at this time, I'm going to unmute and uh, we do have a couple of minutes. So, yeah, let's just go through here, see if there's any questions. Let's go to q and A. I see two here. Uh, love Midland. Yeah. Yeah. Grew up in Midland. I was at a conference in Ottawa last week and I asked if anybody was from Midland. There was one person who put their hand up and I said, oh, and look at you. You're you're brave enough to, to admit it. <laughs> uh, I remember seeing your journey on the news, uh, being inspired it was during a really hard moment in my life, um, and I was, uh, and I was like, "He's doing something great for all of us, and I can endure this this moment and get on the other side." Thank you so much, Joe. Um, thank you uh, for your kind words. You don't know how that kind of impacts me because I go from audience to audience, and I never know what people are going through. But I feel like my job is to encourage. Um, and so re I really appreciate you taking time to to do that. Uh, Joe, when you find yourself struggling to find wind in your sails, what are your primary strategies to get back on track? How do you recommend? How do you reconnect your purpose? That's a really great question, Mark. So if you got a pen, I want to write, I want you to write down something. The letter A, the letter I minus the letter R. The the behavioral model that we used, and I worked with Dr. Sean Richardson was. When I'm distethered, when I'm burnt out, sometimes it's self-care. Sometimes I need sleep and good nutrition and I need a day off, right? So that, that's about, that's about managing, managing energy. But it, it may not be that. It may be that I'm distethered from I, which is inspiration. It may be that I'm not doing the particular A, the actions, or it may be that a situational or psychological roadblock R are getting in the way. So situational is stuff going on in the world. Internal or psychological is stuff going on internal. So when I'm looking at my own behavior, for example, Mark, if I'm, let's say I'm out of action with my health and nutrition, why? 
Why? Is it simply because I haven't put my sneakers on and gone and done what I said I was going to do? Or is there something else going on? Is there something going on here or out there? Right. And at that point, identifying whether it's action or roadblock, reconnect to the reason why I'm doing this. And then immediately try to get into action and do something because action always changes the emotional climate. Sometimes the action is inaction, though. Sometimes that's taking time to reflect or talking to somebody, you know? So I don't know if that's, that's, that's helpful at all, but uh, if you, if you, if you connect with me, um, I, I have a white paper on the air model that again, I'm happy to share with Lisa and, and all participants. Um, and you can, you can actually read more about what I just unpacked there. How long did it take you to start speaking about your story at a long time? It's a really great question. Um, I was successful in business and I won 40 under 40 business in Vancouver from the board of trade. And the last thing I wanted to do was to come out and tell people that I used to be, you know, an East Hastings guy, but something happened. I was doing school presentations under the, under the synonym Shibugi man, which is a whole other story, but I was, I was doing this in North Van. And the managing director for McLean's Magazine's kid came home and told him about me. And he connected the two and called me. And I remember really being really scared. Um, and then they did a piece on me in McLean's Magazine, and I was kind of out. And then after that, I just slowly started to speak. But I was petrified. The first talk I gave, I didn't even look at the audience. I just looked at my notes. But when I came up, there was this visceral impact in the room. And I knew that I had done something impactful and that sort of kept me going okay uh linda sometimes those who struggle uh sorry um sometimes those who struggle with mental health stop reaching out because they feel like they have used up their quota uh, from those in life i guess my question is if someone keeps cycling in mental health and addiction how do you keep the possibility for them going and continuing to reach out yeah, I think that's that's tough because uh, I've had people in my circle who I want the recovery for them more than anything in the whole world. What I do is I continue to hold the possibility. I can hold that possibility for someone. Is it probable? Sometimes no, and it might not go. It might not turn out the way I want it to. So I just try to let folks know that. That look, I'm I'm holding a possibility for you, and try try to be non-judgmental and and always. Again, I have I have a bit of a, an advantage be, coming from the recovery community. I don't care if you tried once or one thousand times. I'm always going to hold the possibility for you. Um, I don't know if that fully answers answers your question. Uh, it is true to eliminate family. Is it true to eliminate family toxicity? I, I'm not too sure how to answer that question because I don't have a context, but <clears throat> I know that I needed to remove, in my early recovery, I needed to move, remove people that, and 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 places that I knew would get, get me into trouble if I was, because I was kind of in a very uh, vulnerable place. There was a great question I got, uh, I got asked last week and that is reflect on the time you spend with somebody on how you feel afterwards and that's a good indicator on the amount of minutes you want to invest and i know that sometimes tough especially when it's very close family but i have to put my teflon on during the holidays um being around some people and so i do i try to limit my exposure to that i don't know if that helps Joe, did you have a fear of uh, changing your life and getting back on track? If yes, how did you overcome your fear? Definitely. I didn't realize it was sort of an underrunning fear of success was more than fear of failure because it meant leaving the, the known. I hang on to stuff when it's broken. I, I've hung on to relationships when they don't work. I've hung on to habits that don't work because it's familiar. The other is unknown. But how I overcame that is by continuing to take steps, possibility continued to unfold as I as I continued to move down the path. So Dr. Carol Dweck, 
talks about this in growth versus fixed mindset. You want to instill that in people, especially in kids, is you get their feet moving. And what happens is the narrative starts to change. You can't do personal affirmations and expect it to change. That's good, but you need to move your feet. And when you move your feet, the emotional climate and narrative changes because now you got evidence. Oh, you know, college. Oh, I'm not dumb. Look at that. I got an A. Right. But definitely there was, there was a ton of anxiety. It still is, you know, three decades later, I'll get moments where it feels icky and weird. You know, um, I feel embarrassed about my past that I haven't been strong enough to be stronger than the impacts of pain. Um, yeah, I won't speak to you on this, but I'll speak to me on this. I've been told, having worked with a lot of different people over the years, that the, the story we tell ourselves around, you know, how we react or don't react, we basically react or don't react to the world with the best set of tools that we have right now. And I don't, I don't know who you are, but I know that I've been told a thousand times by, by Sean and others that given what you were going through at that time, your response was perfectly normal and human. And I bet you that probably rings true for you. So I, I put the stick away. Uh, <laughs> Um, I got one last question. And we're going to wrap up. I have talked about this removal strategy uh, with my therapist, and she has mentioned that strength is in enduring the pain. I don't agree with her, but she is more older and experienced than, uh, than I am. I bounce it off different sources. Sometimes when I get an answer and I don't agree with it, I trust my intuition today. I never before. And so I used to just kind of kow kowtow to what somebody that with initials or something, but I'd work your way through that because you may you probably have better intuition on you than you do. There is resilience to to be gained from going through painful situations, but pain is optional. You know, so and again, I don't know the context of what what this looks like, so I I, I want to be careful.